Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I hope everyone's still having a great time. Uh, welcome to the third and final oral session. Uh, the name of this oral session is Aerosols, Isotopes, and Soils. Uh, this one is going to be exciting because of the diversity of the different topics that we'll be, talk that we'll be going through. <laughs> um, a quick reminder on the format of the session, presenters will have up to five minutes to present, followed by five minutes for questions and answers from the in-person and virtual audience. Uh, a reminder that each one of these presenters have a long-form video recording on the website, which can be accessed through the QR code that has been up for most of the day today. Uh, the session will feature six, speech, six, six speakers and will end in an hour. The second half will be uh, online presenters. We've seen a few of those before. But yeah, without further ado, we'll get started. And our first presenter, uh, will be Jeannie Lorenzo, if you could come up. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hello. How about this? Okay. I don't know if she wants to remove it. Okay. Um, so um, many years ago, um, I was able, to, I was a, a research assistant and I was able to help set up um, an Aeronet sun photometer in Manila Observatory. Um, thankful that many years after I'm here presenting the data. So I come from a place in Southeast Asia called Metro Manila, which has very high air pollution, uh, very bad air pollution. So that's why we're actually motivated to do stuff about air quality. Um, we're also in a region where there's a lot of emerging cities and possible um, aerosol sources in the future. Um, and therefore, we also want to be able to see um, how those sources actually interact with regional meteorology. And so hopefully our study is also able to help in aerosol mo modeling in the region. We used, um, aside from Aeronet data of 10 years, some model data as well as um, reanalysis data, as well as satellite data, to be able to look at monthly aerosol profiles, as well as look at possible air masses and also how these actually interact with regional um, air masses, not just the things we see in Metro Manila, but actually regional stuff. Um, so in this, uh, oh, this is not, oh, it's not moved. <laughs> anyway, there. So um, the red bar shows that actually a, a lot of the particles in Metro Manila are 80% small or fine fraction, probably long range transported coming from um, perhaps in the area of Borneo um, around August. And in green, the largest particles around 50% only small particles are probably coming fr from the ocean north e northeast region um, that are probably, and that we see based on the air net parameters are hygroscopic. So these are long range transported stuff that we see in Metro Manila. Okay, there you go. Um, so we wanted to see that if those were the regional sources, what about the local sources? Could we actually distinguish those based on the AirNet data? So we have volume size distributions on the left, which looks at the um, size um, particles, uh, size of the particles, and we see that we can cluster them into five um, based on their sizes from the AirNet data. I've highlighted here on the right side um, the, um, the 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 coarse particles. Um, that have predominantly um, sea salt in them. And um, the fine particles, which have the higher accumulation mode um, peaks and that have higher um, organic carbon and sea salt contributions. So in order for us to be able to see what are the sources of these pollutions, we looked at certain case studies. Um, so this is a particular one in September. Um, so this has high organic carbon and sulfate. Um, we look at um, model data and see that it's actually transported smoke from Borneo, which is um, corrobor corroborated by um, back trajectories coming from southwest of the Philippines in the area of Borneo. Um, another case we look at is this peculiar one, which has this double peak in the accumulation mode, as well as uh, high sulfate concentrations, which seem to be coming from the northwest of Metro Manila in an area where there's a large coal fire powered plant. So we think this could be something called the cloud processing cluster. 
we look at how those um, how the aerosol air masses we see in Metro Manila actually interact with um, regional scale aerosol that we see. So Mera too has data for 10 years as well that we did some um, EOF analysis on. Um, and we see from that that you see the distinct East Asia source as well as a source in the Philippines and a source in Indonesia. What's interesting about them is that this East Asia source doesn't seem to be the one causing the pollution in Philippines and Indonesia, because when we looked at the winds, the winds are coming from different directions, and thus these sources seem to be distinct. Um, when we looked at another source of aerosols in um, regional Southeast Asia, we see something like a separation of sources in the Southern Southeast Asia, and we're thinking, could that be due to the Borneo um, biomass burning? It seems possible because, again, when we look at the winds around that time of this, um, around August, when the winds are coming from the southwest, they're different in the south and the north, which is probably causing this isolation of this ma air mast here. Um, so uh, as a first step, it's very interesting to see that in Metro Manila, even if 60% of the time, um, it's actually a background marine source because it's an island. Um, the 20% of the local is already very bad because I live there and I think that that's happening all of the time. But in fact, the air pollution local is only 20%. It's very bad. And aside from that, there's 20% that's coming from the regional and the cloud processing. So, Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, with that, do we have any questions? Thank you, Jenny. Uh, just very quick question with regards to your pie chart. Um, these are coming from Mera too? Um, the pie chart is coming from the Aeronet. The Aeronet. Uh, the, the, so we did the Aeronet data, and then when we did the um, clustering of the air masses, then we figured out based on all of those 10 years from how much of that is actually attributing attributed to the each air mass. OK, I was just wondering. Uh, I was just curious if, if Mera too actually underestimated emissions over Metro Manila. Uh, I, I would assume that they would uh, um, underestimate the emissions in Metro Manila just because of the large grid size. Um, but it's interesting to see that Meratu actually saw the sulfate source in the northwest of Metro Manila. So that's something interesting because I guess it's very large. All right, great question. We have another question in the chat. This comes from Dick Thompson. He asks, are there any contributions from shipping, such as large ships? Um, maybe he's referring to the map that you showed um, a few slides earlier. Um, there would be contributions from shipping. Local already there would be. Metro Manila is beside a very big bay, which has a lot of things like it looks like Long Beach or stuff, where there's a lot of um, container, container things there. So there's a lot of carbon, I think, expected also from ships just locally. In terms of international, I'm not sure. But I think you, they did a study, a cruise, and they just went um, several um, in the middle of the Philippines and uh, like near the South China Sea. And there, there's, there it's already super duper clean. So not much international ship travel here, not like, like Atlantic Ocean. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for participating online. We have another question over here. Over here. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, Jenny. Great talk. Um, I was wondering about this pie chart. Like, how do you expect it to change between the um, two seasons in the Philippines? Oh, yeah. So the change in the seasons will probably bring. Um, so the southwest will bring the uh, winds from the uh, the smoke from Borneo, and the northeast will probably bring some of the stuff from East Asia. So not just the ocean, but probably mainland East Asia, including industrial and actually smoke emissions from. Indochina Peninsula. Thank you. Awesome. We might have time for one more quick question, if anyone has one. And with that, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, Mustafa. Thank you very much, Jeannie.
Can you hear me, Bill? Cool. So hello, everybody. I am Mustafa Javadian, a PhD candidate in hydrology working with Ali Berangi. So my presentation is not about aerosols, or isotopes, or soils. It's about plants. So let's, let's go with that. Uh, so my presentation title is Canopy Temperature is Regulated by Ecosystem Structural Traits and Captures the Eco-Hydrologic Dynamics of a Semi-Arid Mixed Conifer Forest. We recently published this work in JGR Biogeosciences. So, uh, so generally, canopy temperature uh, can, can directly re uh, uh, related plant physiology, ecology, and function, and they are both used in water and carbon fluxes, and they can be uh, be obtained from leaf to global scales, and they can be used to assess impact of climate change on ecosystem. So uh, in this study, we used canopy temperature to capture diurnal vegetation water stress over Mount Bigelow at the covariance flux tower site near Tucson. Uh, that if you, if you see our instrument here, uh, we have the, the Mount Bigelow at the covariance flux tower, Equestor satellite, some thermal drones that we have, uh, we had some flux over there, and the network of three subflow sensors that are, uh, that, that we use them as an index of plant transpiration in that region. Uh, and also PRI sensor that can be used as an index of transpiration and plant uh, physiology. Uh, uh, we use that data in this analysis too. Uh, so this is our, our flight plan uh, for this study that we, uh, we targeted a 150 meter by 150 meter box around the, that eddy covariance flux tower to cover the entire footprint of that, of that flux tower. And this is a, a video of that flight, that RGB flight that we had, but basically we use the thermal uh, data that we had from our drones uh, to get the canopy temperature data. Uh, this is the 3D view of our, uh, of our data that shows for, from two flights. Uh, if you see the, the Mount Bigelow Tower here, if you compare this data with the USGS LiDAR, uh, the, the, the tower is much more obvious in our, uh, in our analysis compared to the LiDAR data. So this shows that the, 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 the drones can obtain the top of the canopy better than a LiDAR in this case that has been found in previous studies too. Um, so here you can see the diurnal canopy temperature data and canopy VPD vapor pressure deficit data in different zones, different tree density and different tree height classes. Using a structure from motion technique, we, we were able to capture the tree height and then then classify them as different kind of tree height classes, like tall, short, and average trees, and get the canopy temperature at different scales and compare their temperature. First of all, we found that considering the entire study area, canopy temperature was 1.8 degree cooler than air temperature. The other thing that we found was that, that the canopy temperature minus air temperature was much more different in different tree height and density classes. We found that canopy temperature in taller and denser trees were about two degree cooler compared to shorter and less dense trees. So uh, because of more latent flux that is coming around the taller and denser trees, the canopy, uh, the canopy temperature is much more cooler around those taller and denser trees. And, and that is really impacting the wildfire season in Arizona too. Um, uh, and, and this is the all data set that we used in this study for our flight day and for the entire, entire winter season. Uh, so the, in this plot, you can see the three subflow data, PRI data, and latent heat flux data from the tower. And here you can see air temperature, canopy temperature, and air temperature minus canopy temperature. For the entire season, we used EcoStress land surface temperature data as a proxy of the canopy temperature uh, in, our, in our flux tower footprint. First of all, we found that EcoStereo satellite LST can, uh, can track the canopy temperature from our drone flight very well. So it is, it is really great that we can have that kind of data uh, as, a, as a kind of satellite data. And, and generally we found that flux tower data are not sufficient to partition evaporation and transpiration, but special thermal data, including thermal UAS and EcoStereo are able to capture that better than the flux tower data. And as a conclusion, uh, uh, we, uh, we found that canopy temperature and VPD differed significantly among different tree height and density. 
uh, classes and diurnal canopy temper temperature data were closely uh, related to PRM plant hydraulic rates. And finally, satellite observation from ecosphere captured the diurnal uh, vegetation water source very well. Uh, and as a future direction, we, re we recently installed a fixed thermal camera over the Mount Bigelow to get continuous 10 minute interval thermal images to have a, uh, co have a complete uh, diurnal cycle in our region that we can investigate later. Thank you so much. Awesome, wonderful presentation. Once again, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, that was a wonderful talk. I was just wondering when you pick out these um, locations for delineating your different tree heights and densities, um, was the underbrush or surface um, level pretty homo homogeneous between those different locations? Yeah, that's a really great question. So actually the footprint of the flux tower is not completely homogeneous, but generally uh, they are covered by, uh, by tall pine trees, about 20 meter uh, height of the tall trees around the tower. Uh, uh, typically they are homogeneous, but not fully homogeneous, but the, there are some spots that we have just bare soil in the footprint, but that is really affecting the canopy temperature too. That's a great, great point. Uh, re really interesting work. Um, could you go back a couple slides? You, you had a sure. comment there on your slide about the eddy covariance and um, tower. This and one? I didn't know. It was your conclusion slide. Oh, conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> no, was it the slide before that? I'm sorry. This one? Oh, no, sorry. Next oh, one. sorry. This one? Flux tower data are not sufficient. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I, oh, this one. Flux tower yeah, data are not sufficient. Didn't, didn't quite address that. And I guess that's that's really my question is, you know, how, how much of the temperature differences are you seeing are due to vapor pressure differences are due to less solar radiation at the base uh, and a consequent solar uh, soil evaporation? And, and what, what's the mix going on there in, in, in what you've done so far? Yeah, I, yeah, actually that was something that I couldn't talk about that more. So, uh, so if, if, you, if you look at this plot, uh, there's a lag between sap flow and latent heat flux uh, from the tower here. So the peak of the sap flow and latent heat flux are much more different. The peak of sap flow is in the morning, but the latent heat flux is in, in the about 3 p.m. So it, uh, if we assume the sap flow is, is, is a better index of, of transpiration here, it shows that the latent heat flux doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't track the sap flow very well. But our canopy temperature data is sh it shows a better performance uh, to, to the sap flow data here. So it means that the soil evaporation was more dominant in the morning that the, uh, that the sap flow shows higher values in the morning, but, but lower value in the afternoon. But transpiration was more dominant in the afternoon. So soil is playing a significant role in the morning here, but not in the afternoon. In the afternoon, plants are, uh, are, are playing more significant role in, in our flight day. That, that was a great point. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? There we go, we have one back there. Thank you. Um, Perhaps, I, I mean, I hope I understood this well enough to ask a question. First of all, I really enjoyed it. Um, is it, so it seems like you're using this to adjust based off of the eddy variant, eddy covariant. Would it be possible, like the eddy covariant towers are expensive and they're like individual index locations to like use this in locations without an eddy covariant tower to provide an estimate once you have collected enough data or uh, is that not possible? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So uh, actually, because uh, uh, because flux towers are measure many many variables in a kind of a standard way, it's a it's a really great way to to examine many kind of these hypotheses in the in, around the flux tower because you can compare your uh, uh, your data with the flux tower data very quickly. But in the other cases, uh, there is no validation point to do that. So because of that, we use uh, that the footprint of the flux tower because. There's a kind of a standard way to measure the temperature at different heights and the uh, measuring latent flux that it, it would be very difficult to do that outside the footprint of the flux tower. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Well, let's thank Mustafa again for his presentation and his time. Um, and with that, we have a slight change in the schedule. So just to keep online with online and in-person with in-person, uh, next up, we'll welcome Diana. Hello. So, okay, hello everybody. This is, hello. Uh, my name is Diana Shea, and today I'm gonna be presenting my research regarding the effects that rock dam detention structures have on recharge of groundwater. Uh, I'd like to start off by setting the stage for why this research is important. Last year, I did a literature review about the groundwater decline in Wilcox, Arizona, and I found that they were using up their groundwater faster than they were recharging it. This was causing problems such as uh, land fissures, land subsidence, and uh, residents' wells drying. Uh, this problem is exasperated by the fact that Wilcox does not regulate their groundwater. They're not part of an active management area, and it made it really attractive for large agricultural companies to move in from out of state. Um, and so with groundwater depletion imminent, um, researching ways to improve local recharge is important. And so this is where rock dams come into play. And I'm researching the effects that these rock dams have on recharge of groundwater in two ways. The first way is using water chemistry analysis and isotopes. And the second way is modeling using Hydrus 1D through Python. And so I'm gonna give a quick overview on how water chemistry and isotope data uh, can help us learn more about our water. So for water chemistry data, we're interested in the major cations and anions that are dissolved in our water. And so the longer that our water sits in the subsurface, the more evolved its uh, ions become. So what that means is the longer that groundwater sits in the ground, the more we would expect our ion concentrations to increase. Uh, for our isotopes, we're looking at radioactive isotopes, and specifically in this case, we're using tritium. Uh, radioactive isotopes are isotopes that decay into another atom over time, so it can help inform us on how the relative age of something. So for here in this map, you can see that there's four locations presented here. I took six samples uh, over these four locations. I'd like you to notice that uh, the samples here, they're all within about a mile of each other, pretty close. Uh, and specifically, if you pay attention to our rock dam of interest here, labeled LWU on this map, it is about 80 meters upstream of Krabi Well. And our assumption is if this rock dam is retaining the water long enough to allow for active recharge, we would see it in Krabi Well. So this is the results of the tritium data from the six samples. And if you pay attention to Krabi Well, I took a sample in July and one in October, and we see that the tritium units did not increase outside of the analocal uncertainty. And so this is evidence that Krabi well was not recharged over that last year's summer monsoon season. And the four other samples here have tritium units much higher, indicating that they likely contain some rainwater, especially the 6.4 tritium unit value. Uh, this is the results for the water chemistry data, and I'm just gonna draw attention here to Krabi well. Specifically how, if you notice, most of the ion concentrations tended to increase from July to October, which further supports the tritium data that the Krabi well data actually got a little bit over, older from July to October. Uh, during July to October, I was sampling. I took a, a well sounder data of the, uh, the depth to groundwater in the well, and I found that the groundwater actually rose 3.32 feet. I thought maybe this was an error, but looking back at other data and other well sounding, it's not a singular event. If you look here from December of 2019 to January of 2020, uh, the well actually, the, the groundwater actually dropped four feet. And if we look at a piezometer data, a piezometer was installed in Krabi Well from 2019 to 2020 for about a year and a half. Um, from November, uh, just in two days, we had a spike of a water level increase of three feet. And if we look at the monsoon statistics for Tucson from the National Weather Service, according last year was the third wettest on record. And assuming that Wilcox had a similarly active monsoon, last year would have been a good year for us to see possible recharge over the course of the summer. And so with our water chemistry data and our tritium data showing that there wasn't active recharge over that three month time span, the question has become, where is that water? because we know from the other four other samples that there was rainwater around. Uh, and that's kind of the second part of my research. So the second part of my research is using Hydrus 1D to model different initial conditions and soil types to try to figure out what happened to that water. Where in the subsurface is it? Is it gonna take additional rain events in order to get it into the groundwater? 
And so this is just active uh, research. I don't have answers for this yet, but I hope you guys stay tuned for updates. Um, and with that, I'll take questions, and I'd also like to pose a question to the audience to see if there's any hypothesis for why the groundwater table rose three feet, and yet the isotopes and the water chemistry data didn't show us any type of recharge over that three-month span. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Diana. Uh, any responses, answers from the audience in addition to questions? <laughs> like we have a question back there. The screen interval on Krabby Well, is it in the bedrock or is it in the alluvium? I didn't hear. On Krabby Well, the screened interval where you're monitoring the groundwater elevation, is it completed in bedrock or is it completed in alluvium? That's a good question. The well is 100 feet deep, but there's 40 feet of casing. And based on well log data of an, the well log data for probably well doesn't specify what it's going through, but a well about half a mile away said that the first 25 feet is dirt and the next 35 feet is granite. It's likely that it's, pos it's possibly fractured bedrock is where that end of the casing is. So it, it, it unless it's completed in the alluvium, you are not likely to see a response from recharge events that are influenced by the rock dam that are above it. Because the water could be coming from a fracture set from somewhere else. Like preferential flow because of the fracture bedrock? Is what you're well, well if, if it's not in the alluvium, it's, it's, it's coming from the bedrock system and it could be a separate system. Right, we got one answer to your question. Any other questions from the audience? We have one from online. So this question is again from Dick Thompson. Um, could hydrostatic pressure from recharge further away? Could hydrostatic pressure from? It's phrased a bit strangely, but yes. Could the hydrostatic pressure from further away cause recharge? Oh, okay. <laughs> Something I'll, I'll look into, yeah. So my thought was that, I mean, with, for such a, a rapid increase, it's not, it's, it's not, it's likely not a slow move. Whatever is causing this, this jump, these jumps, it's not. My thought was maybe fractured bedrock, but I thought other people would know better too, so. <laughs> So, so Derek uh, and I are, are hypothesizing that it was pressure pressure wave propagation rather than actual water moving in. So, yeah. Okay. So essentially, what what the the other comment was referring to? The hydrostatic pressure. Yeah. Oh, okay. All very great. Awesome. Uh, well, if there are no other questions in the room, uh, I have another question. Um, so why is this work important? Why? <laughs> well, mostly, I, this is my opinion, but with uh, groundwater is being stressed everywhere. With climate change, with people just increased population, and looking for ways to improve our groundwater recharge, I think is just important, if not now, when. Groundwater isn't infinite. It's a lot of it. But I, I personally feel like it's, it's ways, way, we, we, we have abilities to invent. We have, we're innovative, so we should think about ways to improve our groundwater while we, while we still can. Once land subsides, it doesn't normally get come back out the way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, uh, Diana. That was a great presentation. Um, thank you. And with that, we will switch to our online presenters, uh, the first of which will be Shuyan. So if we can welcome Shuyan as she gets set up. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great.
Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Xue Yan, a PhD student co-advisor by Goyue and Shibi. Today, I'd like to present our recent, recent modeling work about interannual variability of plant carbon uptake in the central US. Plant can absorb six gigaton carbon per year and offsets one third of the anthropogenic emissions globally. Also, land dominates the interannual variability IAV of atmospheric CO2 growth rate CGR the blank bar showing here, which is determined by growth primary productivity GPP and uh, terrestrial ecosystem respiration. Modeling and observations have identified GPP contributes the most to the area of net land carbon fluxes normally. Also, um, GPP shows a greater water sensitivity than temperature sensitivity across mid latitudes and uh, low latitudes. This observation based analysis inspired us to assess model GPP IV and its water sensitivity. We selected the central US because it is a dry to wet transition region, especially the most uh, episodic and intense droughts. However, most of land surface models do not um, explicitly represent root water uptakes and parameterize water stress impacts on transpiration and the photosynthesis processes as a function of soil water availability or soil water potential. They also use clamp hamburger model to describe soil water relationships with suction height, as you can see the red line in the lower, lower right figure. These incomplete representations of plant and soil hydraulics lead to a low plant drought resilience reflected by rainfall use efficiency here, as you can see compared to the green light benchmark data set. So those incomplete representations can overestimate GPP interannual variability and its water sensitivity. That's our hypothesis. To test our hypothesis, we use a recent version of a land surface model 9P that has been greatly improved, improved by incorporating plant hydraulics and uh, Veggie Newton soil water retention model, the green line shown here. The Veggie Newton model can allow less water left in the soil and facilitate plant transpiration as the same suction height compared to the right line, the Kalampunger model. So those um, we perform three experiments. The first is control with um, all the improvements using the recent version of NOMP. And we also perform two um, other experiments, lower and soil age. That's, that's are similar to control, but without plant and soil hydraulics respectively. Here's the results. Um, the two figures show the distribution of mean annual GPP and its interannual variability in the central US. As you can see, control well captures the distribution of mean annual GPP and it, its IAV in the central US. However, uh, compared with three other um, observation-based uh, data sets that are flash nights, MODIS, and GPP, however, um, lower and so age greatly underestimates mean annual GPP by about 47% and 9% respectively. In addition, lower and so age substantially under, uh, overestimates the interannual variability by more than twice. We also computed the GPP water sensitivity as a linear regression coefficient between the 20 GPP anomaly and the 20 terrestrial water storage anomaly TWSC here, showing in the top figure. You can see lower and so is the red and uh, the yellow and red dots and lines greatly overestimates GPP water sensitivity because uh, those two experiments underestimates plant drought resilience reflected by rainfall use efficiency, RUE, as bigger visuals here. But when you look at control experiments, the blue dots, um, it produces a, a lower than observation GPP water sensitivity, which is due to the parameter calibration processes um, uncertainty and uh, a low transpiration ratio that has been found in most of land surface models. 
In conclusion, uh, our modeling study suggests a lens of this model um, with appropriate plant and soil hydraulics can capture GPPIV, but a model with a low plant drought resilience greatly overestimates GPP water sensitivity and its IV. We also suggest the use of Veggie Newton also water retention model because of its better performance in dry conditions. Yeah. With that, I'd like to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Xuan. Do we have any questions here in the room? There we go. We have one. Um, thank you for your talk. That was very informative. So I did have a quick question. When you're when you're running your inner uh, inner annual variability tests and such um, with those various products, are you doing um, a global analysis? Like, is this all across the globe, or do you have a specific region that you're looking at? I, I might have missed that. Oh yeah. So here I only shows the results of the central U.S., but we actually run the model over the whole U.S. domain. And I didn't show other results. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if uh, you guys don't have any other questions, or we have one back here, there we go. <laughs> Hi, Xuyan, thanks, that's a good talk. So um, uh, think about, if you have think about the community change that relate to the, basically the, if you look at the interannual variability or the long period, it's likely the community change, especially for the, uh, maybe the forest uh, uh, species and also maybe the forest change the grassland. So all those things have to think about if you want to, uh, so first, uh, your data itself can show some kind of this trend if it can, if you want to put this into the land surface model, so what uh, some of the thoughts you already consider about that? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, currently, we didn't incorporate the like um, land use changes or community function changes, but and it's a good future work direction. Uh, if we want to incorporate that, I think right now I don't have any thoughts about it. But when you think about so water use efficiency, we focus on dry land already. Dry land al already shows the greatest, uh, I mean, the highest water use efficiency now. So if you think about other community changes, the water use efficiency is a uh, it already reaches the highest, so yeah, it won't change the results much. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, if we don't have any other any other questions in the room, uh, I did want to ask you real quick: um, what of your what aspect of this research do you think distinguishes it from other similar research? Oh uh, yeah, so. I believe to my knowledge, this is the first study like um, exploring the dominant process controlling models like GPP water sensitivity and its interannual variability. Other studies most likely just look at the mean values, not the interannual variability, and they're not explore deeply about the process or mechanism controlling IAV. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you. So let's give a round of applause for Xu Yan. Uh, and welcome Chandler um, to start his presentation. All right, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. 
Awesome. Well, I'm Chandler Noyce, and thanks for tuning in to my talk using argon-39 noble gases and water-stable isotopes to infer changes and recharge the semi-arid Tucson basin over the Holocene. Now, for a little background and motivation, first off, uh, the past 22 years has seen the worst drought on record uh, in the southwest U.S. since 800 CE, and this is pushing communities like the Tucson basin to, again, have to rely on groundwater as their primary source. Now, many regional aquifer systems, including the Tucson Basin undergoing depletion today, contain fossil groundwater, that which is greater than 12,000 years in age. And this fossil groundwater is often inferred as being a non-renewable resource due to recharging in the geologic past under a climate that was both cooler and had higher recharge rates. However, do these past climates or do the large flow system sizes better explain this fossil age of groundwater? And how has recharge of the Tucson Basin changed over the Holocene? So first, we'll look at the modern to 1,000 year age component of groundwater using tritium and argon-39. We'll see in the both upgradient wells that tritium is present with ages of 11.6 and 30 and a half years. Now, it's non detect through the rest of our samples, and that suggests that groundwater is generally greater than 40 years old in the Tucson Basin. Now, looking at our argon-39 data, we're going to see it's detected throughout the basin. And the red numbers here showing ages from 8, 210 to 850 years. And this is important because it shows the presence of a previously uncharacterized centuries old groundwater component present throughout the Tucson Basin. Now, when we look at noble gas temperatures, stable water isotopes, and corrected radiocarbon, we're going to see two groupings and one outlier in our samples. The first group is late Holocene in age with warmer noble gas temps, a more negative uh, stable water isotope. And our second group, however, is going to be early to mid Holocene in age with a cooler noble gas temp and a more negative stable water isotope signature. And then finally, we have one outlier sample. It is late Pleistocene in age, has the coldest noble gas temperature and also the most negative uh, stable water isotope signature. Now, from the late Pleistocene through Holocene, we see 8.4 degrees Celsius of warming. And this is consistent with past research conducted throughout the US Southwest. Um, our changes then that we see in stable water isotopes suggest possibly either a change in precipitation source or seasonality of recharge between our Holocene groupings. And finally, the integration of all of these tracers show differences in climate between the early to mid Holocene and our late Holocene samples, as well as the Holocene groupings versus the late Pleistocene. Now to consider variable recharge, uh, we see that there's a large step up in ages, uh, about 15 kilometers along our transect. And so if we consider groundwater velocity to be proportional to recharge, we can infer the step up in age to be um, due to a change in recharge rates. And so if we estimate velocity through our samples before and after 15 kilometers, we can compare these. So our older samples, we see a velocity of seven times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second. And then our younger samples, six times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second, only differing by a factor of 1.16, so not too big. However, if we look at the time period in between them, inferred as a dry period, we say there's a substantial decrease in velocity at 5.8 times 10 to the minus six meters per second and is about a full order of magnitude lower. Now that's not to say that recharge was a full order of magnitude lower, but it does appear to be substantially lower during this time period. Uh, now we'll look at other paleoclimate proxies, including speothems, lake sediments, and pack rat middens collected throughout Arizona and the U.S. Southwest. A lot of data has indicated that peak aridity in the Southwest US was around 6,000 years ago. However, the data from this study, as well as other studies throughout the Southern Arizona region, suggests it's possibly closer to 5,000. However, if we look at this red box here, generally we see across all of our different paleoclimate proxies, a warming and or drying trend around six or 5,000 years ago. You'll see that between present and 3,000 years ago, there's not a ton of data. However, if you look at the orange dash box below between zero and 1200, we do have a fairly good data set in Arizona. And this is gonna be a reconstruction of Colorado river flows at Lee's Ferry in Northern Arizona, uh, covering a 1243 year span. Now this record shows high resolution data set uh, and can pick out kind of those uh, annual decadal changes in flow. And so to look at this, we tried to use our argon 39 data, which is closest. And you can see the dots are average ages and the bars show error. And the mean ages generally align with the inferences made earlier with changes in recharge rates. However, due to the large uncertainties with argon-39, it's difficult to get that precision that you see in the tree ring data here. And to kind of summarize our main findings, 
Our detections of tritium, argon-39, and radiocarbon throughout the basin demonstrated a spectrum of groundwater ages, and our older ages were due in large part to the large uh, size of our aquifer. Uh, whilst uh, recharge has been somewhat continuous over time, it's been variable. You saw around five to 6,000 years ago, the groundwater ages and paleoclimate proxies showed a decrease in recharge rates. And then finally, uh, those big shifts we saw in noble gas temps and stable water isotopes coincided with this inferred decrease in recharge, uh, further suggesting that shift in climate between the early to mid Holocene and the late Holocene. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the following people and organizations, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful, thank you, Chandler. Do we have any questions? So Chandler, do, you, do your results imply any specific, say, management changes that Tucson water or the region need to take in managing the Tucson groundwater basin vis-a-vis -vis our ongoing drought and this historical, this this ability of you to look at the sort of this age of, of groundwater? So I think one thing that's fallen out of it so far, right, is we see the presence of all of these tracers and we see that recharge doesn't appear to have ceased over the last 10,000 years, though we do see that substantial decrease. And I think one thing that kind of blurs the lines and makes things more confusing is considering aquifer response times where these large aquifers and some of my other research is looking at other a large semi-arid basins around the world, they're going to have these response times on the order of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 years. And so I guess what it gets at, right, is that the research might make it seem like, um, well, we've been having all this recharge, it doesn't matter. But I think the, the implications are that um, we see in the tree rings and some other data that it's possible that, you know, for example, a large drought that's occurring right now over the past 22 years even though the aquifer doesn't appear to be feeling it, if you will, right now, that down the line it probably will. And so I guess that's kind of a consideration to take into account for the future is that even if your aquifer isn't exhibiting the impacts of climate right now because there's an inherent disconnect, that that's something you're gonna have to try and account for in the future. Um, also, uh, I've been in touch with some people uh, that are working on upgrading the Tucson AMA groundwater model. And so we're gonna kind of further chat about how we can use the various tracer ages and everything to update the model as far as recharge rates and such. Great answer, thank you for that. Do we have other questions in the room? Uh, Chandler, what do you believe is the most important takeaway from uh, your research? It's a good question. Um, I think it was kind of intertwined with the last bit I talked about there is a lot of times, a lot of weight is placed on groundwater ages, whether there's modern groundwater present or fossil groundwater present. Um, the age of the water doesn't necessarily mean whether something is renewable or not. You could be pumping a very old groundwater in a very large basin, yet the amount of recharge that basin gets is far more than a very small basin getting less recharge, but it has all modern water. Um, so I think what I've learned most, I guess, over the course of this is not to as far as renewability goes, place kind of all your chips in the corner of groundwater ages. They can be useful in telling you things maybe like recharge rates, um, but not necessarily whether or not the resource is sustainable. Thank you, another great answer. Um, last call for questions. Yeah, we have one here. <laughs> I was going to say we should give him a round of applause. Um, That's a wonderful comment. Yeah. All um, right. Let's do it. Round of applause for Chandler.
And with that, we'll move on to our last presenter uh, of the day. Um, please welcome Cheyenne. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. So hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I know this is the last presentation of the day, so please bear with me. So as you may know, High Mountain Asia or HMA is often called Third Pole, and it supplies the hydrological needs of more than a billion people. So now snow cover is an important component of this need, and past studies have attributed its direct relationships with uh, elevation, meteorological parameters like temperature, precipitation, as well as absorbing aerosols. However, separately, the issue is that the response of change in snow cover to climate is complex, and most studies focus on the linear relationship between these parameters and snow cover. There are often nonlinear interactions between chemistry and meteorology that have not been sufficiently studied about this region, and there is a need to quantify these interactions. If we look at the snow cover fraction from satellite-based MODIS and the European Reanalysis Era 5 products, you see there's a strong discrepancy between uh, the snow cover fraction, especially in the high snow covered regions. So this study is an attempt to reveal the complex nonlinear interactions that may account for these differences. And in particular, we would like to uncover the associations between uh, different era five geophysical parameters and snow cover from the MODIS satellite. So to do this, we built a monthly multiple linear regression model that accounts for interaction terms, you, as you see here, uh, between meteorology, aerosols, and elevation, in addition to individual variables. We then regress our 27 different parameters with more than 300 interaction terms onto the MODIS snow cover product for a period of 16 years from 2003 to 2018. This is daily data. Um, the result of this regression are that these alpha terms, which we define as relevance. So an attractive property of this relevance metric is that they sum up to 100%, which enables us to assign an independent contribution of each predictor to snow cover variability. Here on the right, you can see um, a spatial overview of some different meteorological and aerosol parameters over our region. Uh, where we can observe strong spatial heterogeneity with respect to snow cover. So as for initial results for our monthly relevance for both high and low snow covered regions, there is a distinct feature in low snow covered regions during June and July, uh, which is the late snow melt season. We see an approximately 5% rise in the relevance of aerosol interactions with meteorology. This suggests that low snow cover is sensitive, particularly to aerosol meteorology interactions. We also performed Subsequently, a series of sensitivity tests for low snow covered regions where we moved, uh, where we basically removed certain predictors from our regression model to see the change in the relevance of these aerosol meteorology interactions. We found that removing aerosol variables decreases the relevance of these interactions, which suggests that not only do these interactions of aerosols with meteorology matter, but the relevance more so lies in the interactions of individual aerosol species with meteorology, particularly carbonaceous and dust aerosols. So as for our key findings, uh, uh, we find that for low snow cover regions, aerosol related interactions, particularly with meteorology, dominate snow cover variability during the snow melt season. Moreover, species related interactions are relevant for snow cover instead of just total aerosol loading. And on a related finding, elevation interactions with meteorology are consistently important for snow cover across all months. As for the broader impacts of the study, uh, it lays the foundation of assisting observational systems to monitor relevant drivers of snow cover change. Also, this will enable us to assess the representation of complex snow and climate feedbacks among themselves in different earth system models and provide observational constraints in modeling aerosol induced snow melt in critical regions like HMA. I would finally like to acknowledge the NASA HIMAT grant for making this study possible, and my colleagues at the Atmospheric Chemistry Modeling Group here at Haas for their contribution to this work. Thank you.
thank you again for a wonderful presentation, um, last of the day. But before we move on, uh, any questions? Uh, hi, Chayan. Um, hi. Great talk. I, I just had a quick question. So, so your analysis deals with like um, aerosols and their effect on snow cover. Yes. Um, so from what I understand, um, so aerosols can like deposit onto the ground, affecting the albedo and like snow fraction over time. Yes. Uh, but they can also have like direct and indirect effects on radiation reaching the snow. So which one does your analysis focus on? So it basically is more of an umbrella type of an analysis. So uh, there is both snow albedo effect, which is snow darkening, and you have the direct effect of just basically raising temperature. So this, uh, the model that I'm using basically uses all of these interactions. So you have, it basically considers all meteorological interactions possible with all my individual aerosol species. Awesome, we have another question over here. Cheyenne. Oh, hi. Yes. Um, just a real quick question. Um, would you say that aerosols impact um, snow during the, the late season, or would you say it would be more impactful during the early season snow? So uh, what we found was that it mostly the, rele the importance of these interactions rises during June and July. And over this region, past studies have said that the snow melt actually uh, accelerates during May to June. So my hypothesis is that the interactions that we are talking about has like a, uh, takes a month to basically show a rise in the relevance. So yeah, I would say it's basically late snow melt according to our study. So, but you can say it's just um, June, around June, yeah. Wonderful, and we have one last question from online. Um, wonderful talk. Uh, did you see any changes in peak snow due to aerosol? Uh, if you did, what percent? So um, the issue was that for high snow covered regions, there was not really any um, changes in these in the importance of these interactions. It was mostly for low snow covered regions. Um, so regions like which have like at least less than 20% of snow cover, there we found that these aerosol interactions are really important. So the peak changes are not really visible as per se. Thank you again. That was a wonderful presentation. And with that, that will conclude our final oral session of the day. A big round of applause for all of our presenters. <laughs>